We believe that all faith traditions have something to teach us about how God is working in the world and in our lives. So we're exploring Turkey, where Judaism, Christianity, and Islam meet, all in hopes of seeing how the world of faith we live in today came to be, and hopefully understand each other and even God better for having spent time to listen, learn, and be amazed. Let's explore the crossroads of faith. You're hearing our crew and six or seven members of the Turkish-speaking congregation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Istanbul making their way in Turkish through Did You Think to Pray? Unlike the Greek Orthodox who are celebrating in the Hagia Triada or the Muslims praying in the Suleymaniye Mosque, these church members don't have an impressive sanctuary that towers against the cityscape in which to gather. We drive 45 minutes to a business district where the local members rent a two-story building with a small parking lot. It's a pretty area with wooded lots, and you get the impression that this was once a wealthy neighborhood and the houses have slowly become offices for lawyers and think tanks. Two congregations meet here every Sunday, one for English speakers and one for Turkish speakers. Both congregations also run a Zoom meeting online for members who can't attend the assembly. Even if you live in Istanbul, traveling to the Sunday service could still take you three hours. The city is that massive. The English meeting is attended by saints from other countries who've come to Turkey for jobs. Most of the men are from Nigeria or Sierra Leone and the women from the Philippines. Besides us, there are a few American tourists present as well. The branch president is a businessman, originally from Mexico. In this congregation, the strength of the church relies on immigrants from all over the world. The Turkish language meeting is smaller, just about 10 people present, plus our crew. We're told most of the members are watching on Zoom. We few attempted the hymn reading the Turkish lyrics from a laminated compilation of Xerox sheet music. Dua etin mi, we ask in Turkish. Did you think to pray? Welcome to the 10th episode of our 10-part series, Exploring Turkey as a Crossroads of Faith, a place where world religions have met, overlapped, replaced one another, sometimes peacefully, sometimes not. In today's episode, we're exploring the history of the Latter-day Saints in Turkey, one of many tiny minority religious groups finding their place and building community amongst the majority Muslim population. The size of the present congregation would seem to point to a new missionary effort just getting a toehold in Turkey. But in fact, missionaries first came to the Ottoman Empire back in 1884. In this episode, we'll meet Takui Jensen, the great-granddaughter of an early Armenian convert in Turkey. We'll also talk with a Turkish member living in Istanbul, and we'll meet a recent convert. All three will help us paint a picture of the past and the future of the church in Turkey, the tensions that exist there, and the opportunities available. We do want to let you know in advance that these personal accounts contain instances of violence, including against families and children, but which are an important part of the history of the early LDS converts in the area. Our first guest is Takui Jensen, who spoke to us from her home in Illinois in the U.S. Takui is the great-granddaughter of Artin Uzunian, an Armenian Protestant living in the Ottoman Empire at the end of the 19th century. He was one of the first generation of Latter-day Saints who joined the church in Turkey. Artin lived in a small city that was then called Eintab. Traditionally, Armenians are part of the Apostolic Church, or Armenian Orthodoxy, you might say. Artin Uzunian, my great-grandfather, had decided to leave the Apostolic Church and converted to Protestantism. The Protestants started a college in Eintab, and he became an art professor at that college. But he was still dissatisfied with what he read in Scripture and what was taught in church. We 
owned vineyards. There were hills south and west of Eintab, and you could buy a little portion of the hill and then grow your grape vines there. So he would go out into the hills at his vineyard and pray and read scriptures on Sundays. One night he had a dream that there were two young men who would have a message for him and that he needed to listen to these young men. Within that week, he saw them on the street and approached them and said that he knew that they had a message for him and he was baptized. As a result of being baptized in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he was fired. But what was happening with the church at that time is that they had a great need to start a school. There were no public schools in the Ottoman Empire. They were all private. You had to pay to send your children to school. And the church published an article in the Millennial Star written by Elder Lund talking about how our children were being taught incorrect doctrines. They were being persecuted because they were not members of, for example, the Protestant church that had their school already set up. And he said in this article, a teacher has just come available who can help us start a school for our Latter-day Saint children, which was such a blessing to them. We know that our teen started teaching at the church school that was set up. And Elder Booth, who later became President Booth, was there helping get things set up with that school for the Latter-day Saint children. So this sounds like the church under the Ottomans had to be run very differently than the church in other countries. It was very, very different. Let me start by reading an excerpt from a letter that was written in 1897. And this is a communication within the church, and it's entitled, Facts to be Remembered in Relation to Our Being Recognized in Turkey as a Religious Community. First, it must be remembered that to be recognized in Turkey as a religious body of worshipers, we must be a sufficient number of natives in Turkey to justify the recognition. To be recognized in the Ottoman Empire means a great deal of authority. So I want you to pay attention to what they list here. We would have a seat in Constantinople on the Board of Religions. We would have membership in their city council where we have saints residing. We would have to adjudicate all our small troubles. In fact, have peace courts and would practically have to attend to all probate matters, to all marriages funerals, and own cemeteries, and would have to be responsible to the government for all the taxes of our people. And what ended up happening is the church fell under the Protestant millet. So whoever was leading the program in Eintab, which was often Elder Booth, that person would go and meet with the head of the Protestant college who was leading the Protestant millet, and they would discuss the different things. But ultimately, the elders of the church, the missionaries who were there, would have to see to all of the different civil issues that were pertaining to the saints. So for example, in my family line, my great uncle, Kocher, wanted to jointly buy a house with his mother and his sister, and President Booth, then Elder Booth, had to be the person to see to those documents and make sure that they got filed with the Ottoman government. You don't see that happening anywhere else. So millets were essentially a theocracy, except a, a multi-theocratic kind of government where each religion got to decide on its own punishments for what laws were broken, and it, it was very unusual. At one point, Elder Booth, seeing the poor economic conditions of the saints, he decided to start businesses among the saints. She, you also don't see that, so he started to set up looms with the saints. Our teen, my great-grandfather, was an art teacher, and so he was able to assist in setting up these looms because he understood the artistry that went behind weaving oriental rugs. And so they set up about 10 or 11 different looms among the saints, and that was done by the church. And it's, it's such a different environment. J. Wilford Booth is an important figure in the history of the Turkish Latter-day Saints. He served over 18 years in Turkey, first as an elder and then later as a mission president. 
His service as a mission president was interrupted in 1909 when the church called him home because of the Ottoman violence against the Armenians, and he didn't return to Turkey until 1921, after World War I. Some Armenian church members were able to emigrate to the U.S. In fact, three families left with President Booth on his return to Utah in 1909, but the majority of the church members were still in Aintab, experiencing the terror of the failing Ottoman Empire. This empire had lasted 600 years, but as it disintegrated at the beginning of the 20th century, horrible conflicts arose in Turkey, and the Armenians came under incredible oppression. Because the early membership of the church was drawn almost solely from the Armenian population, this means that the church members themselves face violence and even death. It's a very complicated thing to talk about. You did have persecution from the Ottomans. You also had persecution from other Christians for specifically Latter-day Saints. There's a point where they're at a funeral service and a bunch of Armenian apostolics come in to stone the Latter-day Saints and Ottoman Turkish policemen come in, break up the brawl. So, so there's just this very kind of mixed situation where you see some protection from the Ottomans and then persecution from the Christians. And ultimately, there are so many horrible, tragic stories that play out in my family history with my great-grandfather, Artin, being murdered. They had moved to Marash to start a rug factory business among the saints there. And he was among the people in the branch presidency, ultimately murdered as the genocide really started. And I, I understand that some people don't recognize it as a genocide. I do use the word genocide because as I look at my family history and I look at the criteria for what defines genocide, it follows all of those criteria, everything that happens. I just taught a class on how to write and tell traumatic stories without traumatizing your reader. So hopefully, I'm successful. When you talk about the Ottoman Empire, it was very diverse. There were many languages spoken, and as things were getting really bad for the Armenians. The Ottomans said that the only language a person could speak in public was Turkish, specifically Ottoman Turkish. Our teen and Manoush, they had a six-year-old daughter named Rosa. One day Rosa was walking to school and she started to speak Armenian, just not thinking about where she was. She was among friends, they were speaking Armenian. And one of those friends told on her. They removed her tongue and she got sent home. And when Artine and Manoush saw the state of their daughter, they were horrified. So one version has it that Manoush and Artin fasted and prayed that Rosa would pass because they could not imagine her having that kind of a life. And they believed in a better world, right? A life with God. And so they fasted and prayed and Rosa passed. Another story, probably the worst, is that Rosa would not eat. And after a matter of a couple of weeks, she starved to death. And the third version of the story says that Artin and Manoush sent for the elders and asked them to bless Rosa to pass. And the elders blessed her and she passed away that night. What was the relationship of the church in Salt Lake to those members in Ein Tab? It's not that the church is completely unaware of the saints in Aintab. And there's a huge discussion among them and letters going back and forth. What do we do about the Armenian saints? Are they going to be able to immigrate? What is that going to look like? Is it going to be a bad idea to have them immigrate because they're not educated, because they're not capable of providing for themselves? And so there are all of these practical questions that they're asking in the series of letters going back and forth before President Booth even goes back to Turkey. And I specifically remember one letter that President Booth sent to the First Presidency, which at this time was Joseph F. Smith, I believe. And in this letter, President Booth says, the Armenian saints sing the songs of being gathered to Zion and they believe those songs that they sing. I feel that it would be disingenuous for us to teach them 
that they are to be gathered to Zion and not to aid them in that process. So they start up this little community in Moapa with eight Armenian families that were in the United States at the time. And they see, okay, these Armenians, they can work. Language is an issue, but they will be able to provide for their own needs. They're paying back any of the loans that the church has given them, and they're going to be self-sufficient. By November of 1921, Artine is murdered. We don't know how. And Manoush and her children are in Eintab. None of those details are available to us. And some of the smaller towns within Turkey, there were horrible massacres. In some towns, every Armenian was killed, but the Eintab saints were allowed to leave. A lot of that thanks to President Booth. President Booth comes back, now the president of the mission, and he begins negotiations with the Turkish government to try to bring the Latter-day Saints out of Eintab. Now, when Artin was alive, he would translate for President Booth. So it, it was a very difficult situation. President Booth was able to work with the government of Eintab. And over the course of a month, he was able to start getting passports and visas for the Latter-day Saint members who were still living in Eintab. Among the first to leave were actually Manoush, our teen's wife, and her five younger children, and they get brought by carriage to Aleppo. There are still 57 saints stuck in Eintab and not able to leave. They had received a letter from Moses Hindoyan saying, we have fasted for eight days. And within a few days, the rest of the passports came through. And Elder Booth describes it in his journal. He says, the Mormons were all of the talk in Eintab today because they left in a group. The Eintab saints eventually made it to Aleppo in Syria, where they rebuilt their lives under great hardship. Takawi found her grandfather Corin's journal, written after he arrived in Aleppo. The majority of Corin's journal is about rebuilding the business so that his family has financial security. It's such a large concern for him. But in between those entries about his business affairs, you see a broader picture. He talks about going and paying the weavers because he knows that as a person who owns these looms, that all of these Armenian weavers also rely on him for their food, for their clothing. And there are other things happening that he doesn't ever write about, like canvassing orphanages looking for family members because their families got ripped apart. Eliza was Corin's wife, and she was really separated from her family. She had a niece, Mary. Mary made it to Aleppo, but she told them that her younger sister had to be left behind because her hands and her feet were so swollen from starvation, she could not make the trip. So Mary left her younger sister behind, sorry, not knowing what the outcome would be. And there is an entry in Koran's journal in March of 1922. He says, we've been here for a year and three months, and today we found her. After more than a year of looking through different orphanages, they found Mary's younger sister. Takui's father was born in Aleppo, and as a young man, he emigrated to Utah as a university student. There he met and married a young woman from Wyoming, and they raised a large family in the U.S. I can talk about what happened to my ancestors, but that still lives in us. That is still something that we process that trauma. We process that trauma as a family. And... At, like within my own family, um, of my six children, four of them have been you know, diagnosed with ADHD. I've been diagnosed with ADHD. If you look at the work of Gabor Mate, who was also living in Europe during the Holocaust, you know, another genocide, he talks about how ADHD then becomes a hallmark uh, down the generations of 
trauma and and looking at the work of Judith Landau having that carry across five generations is very interesting how how did it all impact my family it continues to impact my family right but but I maintain the hope of the gospel that not all of that has to be negative that we can take strength that we can focus on the faith that my great grandfather had in knowing that he would probably lose his job and yet he followed what he knew to be true or the fact that Corin I should explain a little bit about Corin so you have a an image of him Corin was actually a hunchback he stood less than five feet tall. He was a meek man. He was a hard worker and he was honest. So as much as he was physically deformed, he was very well respected. My father loves to tell the story of how he was sitting in the wagon as his father went to do business with some of the people in Aleppo and as Koren was walking away, these other men by the wagon said, there goes the most honest man I've ever known. And they were praising his integrity and his honesty. And my father says, every time they said something, my back got straighter and straighter. And you thinking of my hunchback grandfather walking away and my father's back getting straighter and straighter because of the integrity of his father. It's, that's what I choose to focus on. You're listening to In Good Faith. We'll be right back. Welcome back to In Good Faith. Takui's family stories of the Armenian saints needing to flee incredible violence to Syria shows how the church's existence in Turkey had dwindled. But then, over the decades, in Europe, Turkish individuals joined the church. One of these found the church as a student in Norway. I grew up as a Muslim, and in high school, we prepare for a university exam, and it takes about three hours. That determines your life. Mm -hmm. This was in the 1980s. So it's very stressful. So in my last year as a senior, as I was getting ready for this exam, I started going to mosque. I was praying as a Muslim and, and, and without understanding what I said, because Turks don't understand Arabic. Mm. So I had to recite these Arabic prayers and to worship. And I felt something in the mosque, yes. I felt closer to God, yes. But I also felt confused. I said, God, I don't understand what I'm saying. And then I noticed there were no women. One day I said, God, you know, woman is excluded. I said, help me find these missing parts and help me answer my questions. I said, I will dedicate my life to you. Then when I was 16, I got accepted to this school in Istanbul, a good school. And one day I was looking at the bulletin board on my campus. There was a flyer about a scholarship to Norway. I read it and then I left and then Spirit told me, you have to apply. I didn't, but a few weeks later, you have to apply, this is your fate. This is your like destiny. I'm like, what? So I apply, six months later, I forget about it. I receive a letter from Norway and that I received a scholarship. They asked me, they said, which school do you wanna go? What do you wanna study? So. So I felt like something was waiting for me in Norway. I came to Norway, I'm studying there. And then one day I was watching a video called Jesus of Nazareth. And the Jewish people brought this woman, said, hey, we caught her in the act of adultery. What do we do? And and he said, whoever hasn't seen before can cast the first stone. That just hit me. Mm. It was one of the most important moments in my life, I will say. It just hit me. I went to my room, I said, I said, Jesus Christ, I said, in my religion, you're a prophet. But here, some people pray to you. I am confused. I said, if you can help me, help me. Because I have a lot of questions. One day I'm in my apartment and something told me get out and I did. I opened the door and I saw two missionaries passing by. 
I had no idea who they were, what they were doing. I lifted my hand, I said, I want to talk to you. So they started teaching me and the spirit, their faces were glowing, their eyes were glowing. What they shared with me was you know, reaching to my heart. You know, I, it was like, touching me. I mean, like, so I went to church and I felt you know, the same way. So I joined the church and I went on a mission to Arizona, you know, and from North Pole to desert. <laughs> and then long story, but the thing is the Turkish embassy wouldn't want to renew my passport while I was on my mission. And then my mission president gave me a blessing. I wanted to hear like this, like everything will be okay. You will finish your mission, you know, but he said, one day it will come. You will see many wars and stakes in your country and you will help with that. And I was like, wow, being a former Muslim, Christ is so precious. And for us, the Muslims, and he's the son of God, and, and we're also sons of God and the daughters of God. When I was working on the Book of Mormon translation, I had that privilege in 1994, between 1994 to 2000. We were almost finishing, we finished the translation, we were proofreading second time I was in the Book of Alma. I was in the church office building by chance that day. Just I was there one day and working on the Book of Alma chapter 11. And I was in the library there in the, in the translation department and I got stuck. So I stood up and I'm praying, I'm walking around. I said, please help me, help me, you know, help me please God, you know. And, and suddenly I see a section in the library, it says Turkish books. And I checked the books there and I suddenly see it Mormon's book, like Mormon Kitabı. I'm like, I'm like, what are we doing here? We, there is a book of Mormon in Turkish. What are we doing here last six years? So I pulled this book out and I find out it's from 1903. It's it was translated by the Armenian, faithful Armenian brothers and sisters into Turkish with Armenian characters because Turks then used the Arabic alphabet. Mm -hmm. So they use the Armenian alphabet, but somewhere, somehow, someone typed that from Armenian characters to Turkish characters. So I took that book, it's heavily, I will say Ottoman Turkish style, you know, heavily influenced with Persian, Arabic, etc. It's not what we speak today. But that book helped me to finish from Alma 11 to Alma 63 with a special help from the other side of the whale. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, when I was getting that divine help, I felt the prayers of the saints who translated that they pray that their work will not be cast away, that their work will bless the Turkish nation somehow. But their prayers were not answered then. It was answered a century later mm -hmm. when I found that book. So. You hear always the Armenians and Turkish people don't get along, but I felt like they were like Enos, you know, how Enos prayed for the Lamanites, how the Lamanites should receive the word, you know, the, about Christ again, you know, this, that's how they pray for this Muslim nation. And so we are very proud of our church history in Turkey for all those, we are so thankful to all those faithful saints for the great work that they did, you know, in 1880s and, and until 1920s. And there was a war between the Armenians and, you know, and Turkish people. And despite a war, those saints and their faith and their uh, the feelings of charity, and it's just incredible. So, and we're, we're eternally thankful. And I think that work continues in the spirit world somehow. So we're connected. We're getting help from the Armenian saints. When we spoke with Takui, we asked her about her feelings hearing his story about the translation of the Book of Mormon. When he told me that story, I knew it to be true. We know from the Book of Mormon that like, there can be rifts and you have the Nephites and the Lamanites. And how many generations did it take before the animosity between those two groups was settled enough that like Ammon and the sons of Mosiah could go to the Lamanites and meet with them. I absolutely believe that there is meant to be a reconciliation between the Armenians and the Turks. 
I was at an event at church, a musical, and I met two Turkish women who were there. And one of them said that she was having difficulty conceiving and asked me to pray for her. And so I did. And I hope that that continues to be the direction that we move in where, you know, she she had her hijab on, you know, this beautiful Muslim woman can ask me, a Latter-day Saint, to pray for her. And I will absolutely do that. That is where I hope we are going. I do not know if it will happen with my generation, but I have hope for my children's generation. Takawi's family history is crucial to understanding the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Turkey. It's a history of tragedy and trauma, but her hope in the future is inspiring. You can read more about the exodus from Eintab to Aleppo on the website for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. There's an exhibit with photos and historical resources put together by historians James Goldberg, artists E. Parshall, and Shirley Larkins Romney. We'll provide a link in our show notes. You're listening to In Good Faith. We'll be right back. Welcome back to In Good Faith. What does the future of the church look like in Turkey? Will there be multiple wards and stakes as promised and Takui hopes? We spoke with a few converts in Turkey and want to bring you an interview with a young man living in Izmir who's traveled to our hotel and our crew set up cameras and recording equipment in a small conference room. He was excited to speak with us, and although he came alone, he had his wife listening in via WhatsApp on his phone. Around four or five years ago, I was in a spiritual search. I can say that I was in kind of a darkness. There were many things that I was dealing. My search pointed me to Christ. I was visiting different churches, like I was in their service and I was listening what they teach. But in the end, I was always disappointed. Always something made me discomfortable. And it was like a, how can I say, I was continuing my search, spiritual search, visiting different churches, but sometimes I wasn't going to any churches at all because I didn't feel good in the places that I have been. So it continued that way, like for probably two or three years, I went to different churches and And after that, many months, I closed myself to any Christian fellowship. And one day, I saw an advertisement in a search engine. I just followed the first prompt and clicked. I had the prompting to read more, to learn more. And I started to, to talk with missionaries. I started to learn and... I learned many things that I haven't done before. I never tried to communicate with God directly before. I always tried to believe in God with my mind, not with my heart. But the missionaries taught me, one of the first things that they taught me was to pray, to pray to God, to have a direct communication with Him. Step by step, I, when, I, when I start to regularly pray, to read Book of Mormon more and more. And after that, I start to feel a change of heart in me, that I start to feel that I, I am able to hear his voice better and better. I love to compare my journey to one particular chapter in Book of Mormon, Alma 32. First, I just had desire to believe, nothing more. But when I feed this seed in my heart more and more, it starts to grow. I actually start to experience how much the, the gospel, how much our Savior's teachings start to bring hope, bring joy in my heart. And I have been seeing yeah, its fruits in my life. Have any of your family members noticed a difference in you since you joined the church? Especially my oldest brother, he he recognizes the changes in me. 
What did he say? He, he said more outward, he saw, to be honest, he saw more outward changes, like such as he says that I am more confident with myself and I am more open to communicate with others, unlike in the past. And I put more efforts for my life. That's what he said, the examples that he gave. But I know that these outward changes, like they came from inside, like from the change of my heart. Turkey is a majority Muslim country. Yes. And so every other religion is a minority. Tell me about going to church for the first time. What did you think when you went to church? When I first went to church, it was pandemic time, mm. like first times of pandemic, uh, January 2020. To be honest, I didn't worry about going to a church because already I went to many different church meetings before. But when I went there, uh, I saw a, how can I express? I saw a community like a family and I saw people who didn't judge me. <laughs> I had many spiritual and mental wants in me and like many communities that I went before, like they kind of got sick of me, like if I can say, but really they were, they continued to love me. They continued to be patient with me. Like when I came to this little branch <laughs> and, and they helped me a lot, like to overcome my fears. It was even hard for me to go to baptism. And I postponed my baptism like before, but they continued to love me. They continued to serve me. Do you have a chance to serve people in your branch? Yes, because we are a very small branch and maybe we have in meetings, we have between around 10, 20 people in general. And there are investigators who want to learn about the restored gospel because my computer knowledge is good. Like I, in general, set up the, the devices in the branch. And also as I am branch clerk, also I keep the accounts of the branch. And I had a specific experience last Sunday that with my branch president, I went to two homes to give priesthood blessing for health. It was very special experience for me. It was very special experience for me because I was able to see how, how much pain the others have and I was able to feel their sorrow. In the past, many times I focused too much on, on my own problems, on my own pains, but serving always helped me to focus on others, to help them to have relief instead of just focusing how, how much pain I have, how many struggles I have. You talked about feeling closer to Jesus Christ. What makes you feel closer to him? I can say that learning about him makes me closer to him, first of all, and also Serving is very important. Serving makes me very close to him because he served others. He taught others, he healed others, and he ministered others. And when I learn, when I learn from him, yeah, from especially scriptures and the general conference talks, and also when I do the things that he does, I feel much closer to him, I hope more and more people will find peace in Christ and in his restored gospel. I enjoy, I enjoy every time that I teach people. I am also a teacher in institute class. I wasn't able to think such thing. Like, it was very hard for me to publicly speak, but God blessed me to be in such a calling. Like, it reminds me Enoch and Moses, like how they were kind of complaining yes. to God about <laughs> lack of speech. <laughs> but God doesn't, doesn't look like the weaknesses of people. He looks who have desire, who have sincere desire to serve him. When you're teaching, do you feel God's help? Definitely, definitely. 
when I prepare institute and the lessons, I feel that my savior is with me. I feel that I am more than myself, that I definitely feel it. And he's still making me more than myself. And that's all the, the gospel, the gospel is about to bring us to our full potential step by step. I love how you said that, that he makes us more than ourselves when he's with us. Yes. Do you think of yourself as a pioneer? Yes, yes, definitely. I am definitely a pioneer here in my family, in this country. When, when I read about the pioneer stories, I feel very close to them because some of the experiences are very similar. At this point, we took a short break. You can imagine how exhausting it would be to speak in a formal interview in a second or third language. But Keith used that time to introduce us to his wife. They had just been married in the Helsinki, Finland temple only four months before, but she lives in Bulgaria and he lives in Turkey. They met at a singles activity set up by the mission and they plan to live together once they can resolve all the immigrant policies that govern both of their countries. Svetina, are you hearing this? Yes, yes, everything. <laughs> He's doing a wonderful job. A wonderful job. <laughs> I think so too. Yes. What city do you live in in Bulgaria? I'm in Sofia. In Sofia, the capital. Yeah. Very nice. How, how big is your branch? I'm wondering how other people feel in the country because not many people know about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. When people find out that you belong to this church, do they know anything about it? Or what's it like to be uh, in the minority? In Izmir, like there aren't many bad reactions, I can say. Like, of course, people get surprised and people don't think that I made a wise choice. My parents think that way, like for example, but because Izmir in general, Izmir is more a multicultural city, that there are all kinds of people that you can see here. Mm. I didn't see many bad reactions. Like I saw in online, like because I managed a church page, like I saw like some bad words, threats, but in real life that I, I didn't like see like two, two bad reactions. Like, but people definitely get surprised because they don't know about this church at all in general because when they think Christianity, that they only know the Catholic church, the Orthodox church and Protestant churches. Or like they know from some news pieces which has lots of wrong information. What would you like other people who are members of the church outside of Turkey to know about your branch or, or about the members here? We are a very small branch and the church is recently start to grow here. But I can say that there are, there are many strong spirits among the members here and they are always welcome here that when they visit here, we are very happy every time that they come here, that you are welcome here, and we are happy to, to see you among us. We've just heard these interviews with three people, very different stories. I'm talking here with Heather in studio, our <laughs> senior producer. Takui Jensen had to search for a translator who spoke multiple languages. Right, for her um, grandfather's journal, which I've read. You can read this on Amazon, actually. Um, she's making it available, and 
One of the things she told us is that uh, essentially it's sort of like the Rosetta Stone for other people who want to do this sort of translation. Mm -hmm. Um, That uh, sort of helping people, one, who might have an armino turkish diary that they need translated, but also just the process that she had to go through, which was quite involved. Um, And that journal, to me, was sort of astonishing. It's so simple in some ways. It's, It's her grandfather talking about... Uh, rugs. He was in the rug business, and this is this is what we did today, and this is who I could pay off, and this is who I could reimburse, and this is who I like. It's just a log of of money, which you can imagine would have been so important, right? You arrive in a city with nothing. How do you rebuild? Well, you keep track of every lira that's going mm-hmm. somewhere. So, but it's also. Um, all these different meetings that they went to. And they, uh, basically, President Booth made sure everyone was in church constantly. (laughs) Like, it was part of uh, the way he was doing refugee work there was, okay, we'll come to church and let's let's have a meeting in church. Um, And that's interesting. Which also would hold community together. Right. But also let people be assured that somebody was helping them in this really dangerous situation. Yeah. So I love that we have different viewpoints on this because different people from different areas had very different experiences. I think it's important to note that the Turkish government does not recognize the genocide. Um, And so when uh, Takui says, I'm going to use the term genocide, um, she's sort of speaking as historians speak about the event, but the Turkish government doesn't use that term at all. Correct. Correct. When looking at a display on the LDS Church website recently put up about these Armenian saints uh, leaving for Aleppo, even though these were hired wagons, I could not help in those images but think of the early Latter-day Saints in the U.S. in their handcarts and their wagons. Just seeing that photo, I thought, wow, an ocean away, this similar experience. microcosm. Yeah, similar experience. Yeah. And then this interesting Book of Mormon connection. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so beautiful story that Marat, as he's working on this translation, and then finds what these early Armenian translators had done. Right. And that Takui had even taken a, a t- Turkish class at BYU. Right, and heard the story from him. And she told us um, basically that she'd been telling her whole family that story ever since she heard it. It, it meant so much to her. Um And for me, hearing this story, it really deepened my understanding of that narrative of the Book of Mormon. If you haven't read the Book of Mormon, it's the story of a family who migrates to a new land and then is split apart by jealousy and envy and rage and pride. And for centuries, uh, there is horrible conflict between these two parts of the family. Yeah, it's a very human story. It's human and and upsetting. And, you know, it's interesting that we, the smiling LDS people, known for our good cheer, have at the heart of our theology a very dark book. Um, And and this story, I just thought, oh, this is what it means to forgive. This is what it means to come together. And those same examples, for instance, in the Book of Mormon are examples where light comes shining through that. Right. It makes me think of sacrifices people make, whether it was in the 1880s or whether it's today in Turkey. It was really lovely to be able to go on the same day in the same building, first to the English group and then to the Turkish group. And I was just struck by how international the English one is it's it's there for foreigners obviously right who, and, and who are using English as their common language even though they are from the Philippines or from Nigeria or wherever and then this really I just wanted to hug all of the people who were there present in the Turkish group obviously most of them were on zoom but because of just the time it takes to try and get there and back right. to, to travel a city that big They are absolutely pioneers. And this is happening with people everywhere around the world who are in small minority religious groups getting a toehold. And they really have to do stuff that the majority doesn't. Because the society, whatever the majority faith might be, is sort of built to support 
that faith. You know, to me, one of the most um, tender moments, most humbling moments of the whole trip was in that Turkish meeting because we were asked to get up and give, bear our testimonies to these members. And I remember thinking, what can I possibly say that would be of any help to these people often giving up their families, often walking away from all kinds of career opportunities or political opportunities because they've affiliated themselves with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And then sharing the little bit that I had. Um, it was, I just hoped that the Spirit would speak to them and know that they were loved. Make sure to check out the In Good Faith YouTube channel for videos from our series, extras that explore the Sulaymaniyah Mosque, Hayat Triada, the Whirling Dervishes, and more. Did You Think to Pray, written by Mary A. Pepper Kidder and William O. Perkins, used by courtesy of Intellectual Reserve, Inc. This episode was produced by Heather Bigley. Our production team also includes Leah King, Katarina Martinich, and Ashton Rowan. Our sound designer is Daniel Phillips. In Good Faith is committed to the idea that we all benefit from hearing people of widely varying backgrounds share their personal experience with faith and belief. In fact, we think people with such experience deserve some of our best listening. If interfaith understanding is important to you, be sure and leave a comment or review on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts and help spread the word. Find us on Twitter at In Good Faith Pod and on Instagram and Facebook at In Good Faith Podcast. In Good Faith is a production of BYU Radio. I'm Stephen Cap Perry. I hope you'll join me again soon, right here in Good Faith. Mm-hmm.